Code Orange, this is chapters 15 through 17. Chapter 15. Faintly, through the hole where the TV cable had been strung, Mitty heard a radio. He chinned himself on a black iron pipe to listen. The dial was tuned to 1010 winds. The camp bed was not sturdy enough or high enough for Mitty to stand on, and there was no handy stool to drag over, so when the ads came on, he let go of the pipe and rested. When the news came on, he chinned up again. Eventually, he had heard traffic, weather, sports, and headlines. 24 hours since anybody had heard from him, and yet Mitty Blake was not a headline. How could that be? His mother went ballistic when, she might, when, when he missed one hour of school. She was not going to take an overnight disappearance lightly. By now, she would have phoned everybody she'd ever met and his sister Emily, who would be on her way home from college. Mrs. Blake would not want just the NYPD on this, but also the FBI, the CIA, and Superman. In, ex in ordinary circumstances, the police would probably refuse to get involved. 16-year-olds run away and do stupid things, and there you have it. But by now, somebody somewhere ought to be looking for Mitty. But no one was. Mitty felt his way around in the dark, touching every wall, jumping up to touch every support beam, sliding his fingers down electrical wires and plumbing connections, running his hands along the bottoms of rafters. Mainly, he got splinters. Finally, he located a nail so lightly tapped into the wood that he was able to pull it out with his fingers. It was not much of a nail, long and thin, barely strong enough to hang a calendar on. My weapon, thought Mitty. Then he taught himself to find the light bulb from anywhere in the cellar by counting off paces. At some point, they stopped listening to the radio upstairs. Bad enough he was down here in the dark with a nail instead of a chainsaw. Now he'd lost his only friend, the constant cheery repetition of the same old news. If he lived through this, he was definitely planning to patronize all the wind's advertisers, the only people right now who cared about him and wanted him alive. Right over his head, a cell phone rang. Its programmed ring was, here comes the bride. Many had already assumed these guys weren't American. Like, when those planes crashed into the World Trade Towers, every pilot the TV stations called for, called for opinions said, no American pilot would do that. Now he knew his kidnappers couldn't be American. Only a total alien wouldn't recognize that melody. Any American would change it. Maybe the call was from the person in charge, who had been working on the next stage of the plan. Mitty didn't see how they could manage their operation out of this cellar. He had just decided to, to go sit on the top step and try to hear the phone conversation through the door when it opened. Fourteen steps above Mitty stood a man in a red ski mask, jeans, and a plaid wool, wool shirt. Behind him, Mitty could see kitchen cabinets. There was not time for Mitty to take the stairs in a single bound and stick his foot in the door to keep it from locking. The guy tossed a McDonald's bag at Mitty, stepped back, and slammed the door. The cellar was dark again, but Mitty was a total fast food fan. He could figure it out by feel and smell. Two burgers, large fries, a chocolate shake, and an apple pie. It was like Thanksgiving. Mitty chowed down. When he finished, he was still hungry, so he licked the paper for leftover salt and grease. Then he folded the bag neatly and set it on the end of his camp bed saving the napkin and the empty flattened fry and pie boxes. His tool collection. He was afraid he'd lose the nail if he set it down, so he didn't add that to the pile but slid it carefully into his jeans pocket. The food took care of the pain in his gut. Now all he had was the hole in his cheek and the throbbing in his skull. And fear. He had lots of that. Mitty knew now that he'd spent his life pa paddling in a clear pond, happy and dumb as a duck. Now suddenly the water was deep and murky. Slime had him by the ankles. For the first time in his life, music was a barrier to thought. So he put away the iPod. How miraculous that nobody in America had the slightest idea what smallpox was like. Not one of the 290 million. But smallpox was exactly what his sources said, the number one biological warfare agent. The stumbling block in bioterrorism is that some scientist in some laboratory had to sneak the disease out. Who would risk his own life, his family's lives, his colleagues, in fact, the lives of everyone in his whole country? Even if that scientist hated America with all his heart and mind and soul, that hate would be the opposite of some love, wouldn't it? Love for his country or people or religion? 
And he would not risk his own life, would he? And so bioterrorism would always be a threat, but it never would be acted upon. Until he, Mitty Blake, allowed terrorists to skip a step. He personally was providing the virus, and in a central location, too. The only risk was to Americans, and that was the point of terrorism, putting Americans at risk. Mitty had never gone out of his way to gather or to exhibit intelligence. But it was time. He was past the stage where he could gather information. All his intelligence had to be guesses. But maybe all intelligence was guesses. How were they planning to use Minnie? Did they hope to create an aerosol and release that somewhere in the city? It seemed pretty high tech for guys keeping a prisoner in a cellar with a rusty toilet. The only real option for these guys was to use Mitty as the infection agent, just as Derek had described. But even in New York, two gowned, masked, and gloved guys pushing a coughing, moaning carcass in a wheelchair through, say, Penn Station were bound to attract attention. And even if the regular passengers averted their eyes, the major train stations were crawling with security. These two guys would have to dress normally and just face the fact that they were going to get smallpox too. But no matter what clothes they put on, they weren't normal. People who plotted to commit mass murder were not normal. So, properly dressed, would they duct tape Mitty into a wheelchair and start pushing? They'd want Mitty to breathe and cough, and they wouldn't want him to want him strong enough to yell because it would really screw up the plan if the human bomb started shouting, call 911. They probably had about a 10 minute window where this would work and then Mitty, flat out with agony and black blisters, would be screaming his head off with pain and the authorities would come running. Well, that was what happened when you committed your terrorism on, terrorism on the spur of the moment. You had glitches. After all this thinking, Mitty arrived at exactly two conclusions. One, the guys upstairs were not normal. Two, he was in big trouble. <clears throat> of course, they could be soft-hearted kidnappers. He wouldn't get a rash, and he wouldn't get sick, they wouldn't have their virus, and a week from now they'd say, oh, too bad, and slip quietly away, leaving the door unlocked so Minnie could head on home. They had another glitch, although they didn't know about it. The hole in the floor where he'd yanked down the cable cord. One book had had a gruesome story about some poor woman in a British lab. Smallpox research was taking place on a different floor from hers. A window cracked for fresh air carried the virus outdoors. The breeze lifted it around the side of the building and up through her open window and into her room. She died. These two men had darted out of the cellar like squirrels from a dog rather than let Mitty touch them again. If they had been vaccinated against smallpox, wouldn't they have stayed to beat him up a little more? So they had no protection except their layers of paper. Plus, if his guesses about the rustling sounds were right, they stripped off their paper covers once they got upstairs. Should have done your research, Mitty said silently to, to his captors. My virus is wafting into your lungs right now. Hours later, Mitty pulled the light bulb chain. After so much time in the dark, 25 watts felt like the sun in July. Mitty did a quick skin examination and then eased up the stairs with his nail. The bulb was too distant and weak to light up the door, so he was still working in the dark. Mitty patted around the handle until he found the keyhole. Time to learn lock picking. This did not turn out to be a silent activity. The guys upstairs were either sound asleep or out of town because scratch, poke, twirl, and stab though he might, no one came to stop him. He achieved nothing with this nail. He rammed it hard and it snapped off, filling the keyhole. Minnie sighed. He went back down, pulled the chain again, and stood in the dark. His original plan had been to die prior to getting the disease so that the disease couldn't exist. How did a person die on purpose when a person had no weapons? Over the long term, a person could stop drinking. If you didn't take in any water, it would be pretty quick, Minnie thought. You couldn't go 48 hours without water, could you? Maybe you could go twice that. He'd be infectious by then. Minnie had no desire to die. He had a million hopes for life. He wanted every minute of his life, and in his family, lives were long. His father's father was still running marathons at 88. Well, he was entering marathons, at least. That was the kind of gene pool Minnie had. Plus, of course, his relatives all followed longevity rule number one. 
don't get smallpox. Rule number two would be answer the right emails. If only he had more knowledge. If only these guys were talking so he could guess something out of them, figure out who they were and what they stood for. If only he could win them over or entice them into a trap or guide them into kinder, gentler lifestyles. But far from moving them to a kinder, gentle, gentler lifestyle, this little adventure would probably whet their appetites. No doubt they too were having smallpox dreams, but picturing New Yorkers screaming and suffering, scared and dying, as presumably Muhammad Atta and his 18 cohorts had pictured New Yorkers screaming and suffering, scared and dying. It came to Mitty that it didn't matter who these guys were and where they came from. It didn't matter whether Mitty was getting smallpox or not. And it didn't matter whether these two got smallpox either. What mattered was this. If they couldn't use Mitty in biological terrorism, they'd move on. They'd plan and carry out some other type of terrorism. He thought of the magnificent passengers on the flight over, the Pen <clears throat> on the flight over Pennsylvania on 9-11. <clears throat> Men and women calling home, getting the terrible news, grasping the full horror of what was happening. They were, they were to be used as a bomb to bomb the Capitol. And the passengers said, no, nobody is using us as a bomb. We'll take you down first. We'll die, but you won't win. Mitty would follow their example, and he'd kill these guys along with himself. The world didn't need them. As Derek had pointed out, though, that wouldn't get rid of the guy in charge who was safely off in the mountains or wherever. But Mitty couldn't accomplish anything in the mountains or wherever, so he considered what he could accomplish in the basement. Gas, fire, water, electricity. City people did not tend to know much about their basement, and if they lived in a huge apartment building like Mitty's, they had never even seen it because that was the territory of the maintenance staff. Mitty, however, had a country house, and in that house, over the years, anything that could go wrong had gone wrong. His father had fixed everything at least once. If he had to hire guys to do the work, like when they put in central air, he would drive out to Roxbury constantly to ask questions to be part of it. But whenever possible, he did the work himself on the weekends. <clears throat> so, Mitty knew more about a basement than your average Manhattan kid. He could break the water pipe so that the water supply could not be turned off. There was no sump pump down here to take water back out. He had no idea how quickly the, da the basement would fill with water, probably hours rather than days, and he didn't have to fill the entire basement. The water just had to enter the electric panel. Once that happened, he was toast. But he tried to imagine himself standing quietly in water up to his chest, waiting to be electrocuted. <coughs> no. He'd be hanging from the rafters by his toenails, trying to, trying to stay out of water. He could blow the place up. The furnace would have a safety device that shut off the gas flow if the pilot went out. If Mitty disabled it and then blew the pilot light out himself, gas would keep pouring into the basement. After a while, all Mitty would need was a spark. But for safety reasons, gas had a stinking smell added to it, just so that that couldn't happen accidentally. These guys... <clears throat> they would know what was going on, and they'd have plenty of time to drag Mitty out, go into their duct tape routine, throw him in a vehicle, and find another place to hunker down. He considered a third possibility. This was the one he had thought of uh, all through the first night, because of course he knew the moment he glanced at the furnace. Mitty Blake prayed, God, what I need here is courage. Don't let me wimp out. I hate wimps. Don't let me get scared. I don't have time. Don't let me screw up. I don't have time for that either. Neither does New York. Chapter 16. Thursday passed. Friday crawled by. <clears throat> Every now and then, they threw hamburgers down the stairs. Mitty tried not to leap up and grab the bags, tried not to rip them open, tried not to gulp each burger in two swallows. But he was starving. The heat of the food, the smell, the taste, even the tiny instant of action were, were relief from the dark the monotony, and the fear. Sometimes Mitty kept the light on, and sometimes they turned it off from upstairs. Mostly he slept. The cot sagged even more under his weight. Sometimes he used his folded t-shirt for a very thin pillow, and sometimes he wet it down and used it for an ice pack for his cheek, which was now hot and swollen. <clears throat> his headache had returned, but it was different now. Heaviness at the base of his skull blunted his ability to think. 
Now and then he heard murmurs upstairs, but he could never distinguish words. Several times he smelled coffee. He tried to plan. After he discarded ridiculous or hopeless or pointless ideas, not much was left. Every plan he came up with required the cooperation of the guys upstairs, and that was a stupid thing to expect. Now and then he chinned himself up to the ceiling to listen to the radio. The Harlem Globetrotters were at Madison Square Garden. The temperature was 38. The World Trade Center Path Station, which had reopened, was once more the busiest stop on the line with 30,000 riders a day. Still no mention of a missing teenage boy from the Upper West Side. On Friday night, the Blakes would normally drive to the country. Mitty could not begin to imagine how his parents were handling this. There was no way now to, to retract the letter on the computer, and maybe it was just as well. The letter had become more true than he had anticipated. Every terrorism expert Mitty had read said that the next attack on America would be soon and would be worse. Mitty was the only person who could make sure this particular bunch of terrorists couldn't carry out their plans. He liked to think that, for New York, he would do anything. But what? What could he actually do? At some point, he checked his skin for the last time. Then he sank back into his sleep. It was a deep, heavy sleep, as if his body knew this was its last chance. He didn't wake up when the door at the top of the stairs opened. He didn't wake up when somebody walked halfway down. He didn't wake up when that person changed his mind and went back up the stairs, leaving the door open. But Mitty, what woke Mitty later was the smell of hamburgers and fries. But even though he could smell them, he could not drag himself up out of sleep. The guard did not throw the bag. He came all the way down the stairs. Slowly, Mitty turned his head. After a while, he opened his eyes. He could sort of see blue paper and the red ski mask, but he couldn't keep his eyes open long enough to know if it was real or a dream. He was cold. He wasn't wearing his t-shirt. He must have hung it up by the furnace to dry. The vinyl of the cot bothered his skin. The guard was carrying a small black cylinder. Oh, he'll shoot me, thought Mitty, unable to care. But it was a flashlight. The guard played the light over Mitty's, over Mitty's bare chest, arms, and face. Then he stepped back, calling urgently to his partner, who ran down to look. They screamed at each other in the language Mitty did not know, and then the second guy ran back upstairs and rustled into his paper. Mitty knew what they were looking at. Macules. Still flat like freckles at this stage, little clusters of dots on his chest and arms, thicker on the backs of his hands, and probably thickest where, Met where Mitty couldn't see and where it mattered most, his face. Mitty had seen them last night, standing under the light bulb for his final exam. The men crept closer, hunched down, staring at Mitty as if deciding whether to use wasp spray or rat poison. Then the first guy straightened up. He jabbed his arm and closed, and closed fist at the ceiling as if he held a rifle. You will die, he said to Mitty. It was the first thing he had said out loud. He, said, he had the same accent as the woman in brown. You will die, he repeated. And now he was laughing. And then your people will die. We, he told Mitty, we will dance in the streets. The men went backward up the stairs as if the virus could not approach people who dared to look it in the eye. And then they kicked the cellar door shut. My streets, thought Mitty Blake. My Broadway, my Columbus, my Amsterdam. No, you will not dance in my streets. They had left the bag of hamburgers and fries at the foot of the stairs, directly under the bulb, a dozen feet from Minnie. The smell was nauseating. He didn't want to throw up, but he had to. He thrashed around on slick poly polyethylene. He could not accept that he was never going to be comfortable again. After a long time, he dragged himself to a sitting position. His knees formed a handy head rest for his head, which was now too heavy to lift. He tried to get up and couldn't. He rested for a while and then slid to his knees and crawled to a lolly column that braced a, a rafter. He hauled himself upright by the metal post. Walking was harder than he expected. Even keeping his balance was hard. The journey to the toilet was long. When he got to the toilet, he bent over it, gripped its sides, and began retching. For a few minutes, it was just awful pointless choking. His back curved over and his gut clenched. And then it happened. He really vomited. The acid burned his throat and his mouth. 
He tried to turn on the faucet, but didn't seem to have the strength. When he finally got a trickle, it hurt to bend, hurt to hold his mouth to it, hurt to swallow, and then he couldn't turn it off. He made it back to the camp bed and gagged again, spitting threads of sour vomit right where he had to lie down. It didn't make any difference now. When he dropped on the camp bed, it finally collapsed from his weight. And then he let out a cry of despair and went down on his knees next to the ruined bed, balling himself up, cradling his head with his hands. Mitty was not a shudder of tears. He didn't cry now, either. He just whimpered, like a dog whose paw had been run over. He might have slept then. He might not. He knew only that he begged God to let it happen faster. He couldn't keep this up. But there were no choices for Mitty now. He had to keep this up. After a long time, Mitty heard himself use the last word on earth he ever wanted to use. He hadn't planned it. He didn't want it. He couldn't stop it. Please, he thought. When he realized they could not hear his thoughts, he summoned all his strength and cried out, Please! Nothing happened. Eventually, he slept on the floor. The cellar door opened and he half woke, half remembered where he was and what he was doing. They both came down. Maybe they would nurse him, bring him water. He tried to wet his dry lips, but it didn't happen. He framed the word, but produced no sound. Water, he begged silently. Mitty was filthy from his running nose, his vomit, and even by this time, his urine. The guards jeered at him in their own language, but Mitty fell asleep again. The next time he woke up, 10 seconds later, 10 minutes, maybe even another day, he saw that they had brought a cheap folding guest bed down into the cellar, the metal kind with the blue ticking stripe, striped mattress supported on wire links. It was old-fashioned and institutional looking, as if Typhoid Mary had just stopped using it. It had little wheels, maybe so the corpse could be easily removed from the room. He knew they had not brought a bed to give him comfort. They just didn't want to bend down on the floor when they needed to do something for Minnie. And keeping him alive for whatever time they required would take nursing care. They crossed their arms across their chests. They weren't holding anything, having used to their hands, having used their hands to carry the foldaway bed. They waited, obviously hoping he would climb into his deathbed on his own. Mitty was willing. He was desperate to rest his head on something soft, but he couldn't move. He wept instead. This time real tears came, as hot as what must be boiling within him. They got on either side of him, their paper layers scraping against his poor skin. Mitty's body was flaccid and heavy. He fell against the edge of the fold of bed, which rolled several feet into the darkness. One guard stepped over to retrieve it while the second guy tried to steady Mitty. Mitty flung himself sideways with every bit of strength he possessed, and the two of them hit the floor together. Mitty grabbed the guy's head and slammed it down onto the cement, rolling away fast to avoid a kick from the other guard. He rolled around the column and leapt to his feet. The second guy's gloved fist caught Mitty in the cheek, splitting open the earlier wound, but Mitty hooked the bed with his foot and rammed it into them, giving himself a barrier and enough time to leap up the stairs. They had left the door open. They always left it open. Mitty scrambled for the door, and they screamed in rage, vaulting on top of him, fingers closed around his ankles. They weren't letting him get out of here. But Mitty didn't want to get out. He yanked the door shut, and automatically, it locked. Mitty wiped himself down with his palms, smearing the little dots of coal dust that he had so carefully put all over his skin. He looked down at the masks of his captors. Fooled you, didn't I? He said, grinning. Chapter 17. They hauled him down the stairs by the feet. His bare chest and wounded cheek whopped against the rough edge of each tread. Then they kicked him aside so they could attack the door. The kick caught Minnie in the jaw, right where he had already taken two blows. One of the guys began hitting the door, swearing at it in English. It wouldn't be hard to pull these two over the edge and make this a real fight. But Mitty still had things to do, places to go, people to see. He put the furnace between himself and them. <clears throat> Suddenly, one guy calmed down. He laughed. He lifted his paper packaging, reached into his pants pocket, and took out a heavy, jangling ring of keys. He held it up for Mitty to see. Mitty hardly noticed. He was fighting nausea. He had not expected that. He had faked being sick. 
He had planned for two long, empty, boring days and nights exactly what it would take to convince the guys upstairs that they needed to be down here with him. He had gone on and on displaying one lousy symptom after another until he thought it would be a, it, it would be a lunatic before these two guys took any action. To keep up his act, he had told himself lies hour after hour, and now he didn't know if it had been an act. Had he forced himself to retch and whimper and moan? Or had it been happening anyway? Had he been kidding himself that he was faking it for a higher cause? If he were to rest his head on his knees right now, he would never lift it again. Because my jaw's broken, he said to himself, not because I have smallpox. He did not know why this mattered to him under the circumstances. At the top of the stairs, they were getting nowhere with their key. Their bodies blocked any ray of light given off by the bulb. Now they were probably yelling at each other because neither of them had brought the flashlight. The keychain guy came back down the stairs, held his keys up to the light bulb, carefully picked out the right key, and went back to try again. No go. He yelled at the keys, yelled at the lock, yelled at his friend. Then he tried every key. Give it up, thought Mitty. I jammed the keyway with a nail. His jaw was exploding with pain. He spit a tooth into his hand. <laughs> so much for all that orthodonter. They stared down at him, motionless in their blue paper clothes and their red masks. And then, here comes the bride, rang out. Mitty had assumed that the clunking sounds that preceded their every move upstairs were the emptying of pockets. The key ring, the cell phone, the whatever. He'd been wrong. They had their keys and they had their phone. Now they just summoned backup. But the phone rang on while the men pounded on the door. They had indeed left it in the kitchen. Unfortunately, not answering the phone would also bring assistance. Whoever was calling must want to know how things were going. And when they didn't get an answer, they'd try again, and then a third time, and then they'd get in their car and come investigate. I have no hope, thought Minnie. My plan won't work. He retreated to a corner of the cellar where they could not quite see him from their post at the top of the stairs. They descended a few steps so they could keep their eyes on him. I do have smallpox, he told them quietly. <clears throat> I faked the spots with coal dust, but the rest is real. This is day 14 and I'm infectious, and no paper shirt is going to keep variola major from its work. You're dead men. He made his way to the faucet. He swirled cold water around his mouth and spit out the blood. Then he drank. He wished he'd paid more. He paid attention in history and English. If he had actually read his Shakespeare or Homer, if he actually knew the battles of the Revolutionary War or the World Wars, he could tell himself those stories and pretend that he was about to die a warrior's death. But he wasn't. The guard sat down, one on the second step from the bottom and the other several steps higher. Mitty was used to their ski masks now. <clears throat> he was glad when he that he would never see their faces. It made things easier. He did not sit near the water supply because eventually these two would want access to it. He needed his own corner of this very small space. He headed for the furnace. He did not like. He did not look at his goal. This was like basketball. You kept your eye on the person guarding you, not on the person whom you were going to pass. He was very close to his captors now. The stair rail was between them, but this was a visual barrier, not, barrier, not a real blockade. He took another step. The men did not seem to sense anything coming. Mitty reached up fast and clapped his hands like cymbals, smashing the single light bulb between his palms. Splinters of glass sliced his palms, meaningless compared to the pain in his jaw. In the dark, Mitty moved fast. These guys knew where they were on the stairs, but they couldn't be able to find their way in the dark. They shouted pointlessly while Mitty slipped behind the furnace and grabbed the t-shirt he had put there. This was a gas furnace. And Mitty knew that when gas combines with oxygen, it burns cleanly and produces colorless, odorless, tasteless carbon dioxide, which goes out a metal pipe and up the chimney. If the chimney is blocked, though, the waste gas does not, does not leave the cellar, but instead begins to fill the space left by the burned oxygen. Eventually, the proportion of oxygen to gas changes, from then on, as the gas burns, the result is colorless, odorless, tasteless, and very poisonous carbon monoxide. The furnace in this old cellar was also old. Nobody had been maintaining it. 
Mitty considered the possibility that he felt this lousy because the flu was in bad shape already and he'd been breathing in a low level of carbon monoxide for four days. But in the end, it didn't matter because this was the end. Ignoring the glass splinters in his hand, Mitty felt along the length of the metal flue pipe. He located the draft staff, a stat <clears throat> with its small round swinging door, shoved his t-shirt into the flue and plugged it. By morning, they would all be asleep for good. Quickly, Minnie moved back to the wash tub, his socks silent on the cement. He turned on the faucet again so they'd place him on that side of the room. He kept expecting them to pulverize him, but they didn't come after him. Maybe they still believed that they wouldn't get smallpox if they just didn't touch him. Maybe they were afraid of spiders, I mean, who knew? Minnie prayed silently, but the wrong prayers came out. He bargained with God. Let me live. I'll be smart, hardworking, useful, and generous. Is it a deal? I'll be the best student in the whole world, the best son, the best everything. The Blakes went to church maybe four or five Sundays a year. Mitty remembered a lot of those Sundays individually. Different churches, different ministers, different states. But Mitty always felt the same. Equal parts insider and outsider. Don't go begging God for help in tight spots, one minister had said, when you didn't bother to thank him for the good ones. When Mitty suddenly knew that he was an insider after all. I didn't bother, Mitty said to God, but luckily it's you, and you always bother. So here I am, and I'll see you around pretty soon. Time moved slowly. Every now and then, the, kitchen, the phone rang in the kitchen. The guys had gotten cold. Mitty was used to it down here, but they weren't. They moved the bed next to the furnace. By the burner light, Mitty could see them in a ghostly sort of way. They didn't lie down, but sat with their backs together, propping each other up nice and close to the source of the carbon monoxide. One of the terrorists had a, rich a wristwatch that lit up when the he pressed the little knob on the side. He lit it constantly. Mitty checked his own watch. Saturday night, February 14th. The outer edge of the catch, a small, catch smallpox or not schedule. He stroked his chin, but since the first visible symptoms were not raised, he would never know. On the other hand, if carbon monoxide got him first, his complexion would be turning cherry red, the outward sign of that kind of poisoning. He felt awful. He was going to fade before they did. It would be so lame if they got through this and he didn't. If only he could be alive to make sure his plan worked. Minnie needed to rest his head on something. Paper rustled as the men turned to watch him, but they didn't get off the mattress. Minnie curled up at the base of the stairs. With the bottom step supporting the weight of his head, he felt marginally, marginally less terrible. He had not done much to, to save New York, but he had done something. He thought of Olivia. This was not the Valentine's Day she had wanted. He made his apologies to his parents. You gave me good genes and good roles and good love. I'm sorry this is going to be lousy for you. He gave God thanks. You gave me great parents and a great life. But I shrugged. Thank you for letting me have a few days when I didn't shrug. Minnie closed his eyes. He slumped down. After a while, his head rolled onto the floor and his body blocked the stairs.